All right, just going to do a video scripturally refuting this charismatic doctrine of the so-called private prayer tongues. Now, what is that? Well, the private prayer tongues, the Pentecostals and Charismatics, often teach that there are two types of tongues described in the New Testament, the public language tongues of Pentecost and the private prayer tongues uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2 to 4, and 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 13 to 14. And they make a big mess out of this. And let me, let me go through a couple points on the matter of refuting this false doctrine of this, this charismatic private prayer tongues, which is them doing this demonic gibberish uh, coming off as what they think is so-called prayer. It's just, it's their demonic gibberish, basically. But it says here, uh, basically, and here's, here's, here's what my points I want to bring up, basically. These are my notes. Uh, first of all, the unknown tongues required an interpreter. This shows that these tongues were able to be understood, not the demonic gibberish of the, the uh, charismatics and Pentecostals. Because in order to have an interpreter, they have to be able to be understood by the interpreter. And you, you can't understand this demonic gibberish. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26 to 28. How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two, or at the most by three, and that by course, and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Now the part about being silent, what's it referring to there? Well, if nobody can understand what he's saying, he's talking to God. Why? Well, because God can understand any language. See, biblical, you compare this with Acts chapter 2, where the tongues were known languages. If nobody can understand his language, then he just talks to God. Why? Because God can understand all languages. I mean, God created all the languages. It's not, again, this does not prove, again, the unknown, the un incoherent gibberish that charismatics do. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10 to 11. To another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, discerning of spirits, to another, diverse kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these things, all the, but all these, worketh that one uh, uh, in a self-same spirit, dividing to every man, severally, as he will. I'm not good at reading on a computer, but we have, again, the interpretation. You can't interpret something you can't if you can't understand it. You can't interpret this sha la 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 la, you know, hasha hama, whatever these guys do. I mean, it's a bunch of demonic garbage. But you can't interpret that because it's not languages. It's it's a bunch of gibberish, from devils, by the way. Next point is that prayer is a conscious, willful, understandable act on the part of the believer, and that he is speaking to God in understandable terms. Okay, Paul's instructions on prayer show this. Romans chapter fifteen, verse thirty to thirty-two. Romans 15, verse 30 to 32. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service, which I have for Jerusalem, may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with, the jo with joy by the will of God, and may but with you be refreshed. Okay? Again, it's a willful, you can understand what they're saying because he's, he's telling them what to pray uh, for him about, okay? So this shows that it has to be a understandable, you know, it can't just be this gibberish. It has to be an understandable terminology. I'll put it that way. Further examples of this, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18 to 20. Ephesians 6, verse 18 to 20. Praying always with all prayer and supplica supplication, uh, in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints and for me that utterance may be given unto me that i may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which i am an ambassador in bonds that therein i may speak boldly as i ought to speak you can't do that if you're speaking this incoherent demonic gibberish uh, colossians chapter 4 verse 2 to 4 colossians 4 verse 2 to 4 Continue in prayer and watch in the same in the same with thanksgiving, uh, with all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest that as I ought to speak. So we see it has to be again you're making utterance of the mystery of Christ. It's a co it's a coherent, understandable terminology. It's a, it's a coherent, understandable saying that you're speaking there. Okay. Uh, further evidence on that, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18 to 19. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 18 to 19. 
Pray for us, for we trust for we trust we have a good conscience in all things willing willing to live honestly. But I beseech you that the rather but I beseech you the rather to do this that I may be restored to you the sooner. Okay? Again, further showing it's a no it's understandable terminology you're using there. Next point, uh well adding to this point, I'll put it that way, is that Jesus gave the example of how to pray, and it was not gibberish. Uh, Matthew chapter six, verse nine to thirteen. Very well known scripture, the Lord's Prayer. And notice that Jesus didn't do the Lord's Prayer in gibberish. See, every example you see of prayer is never in, in gibberish. You don't see that anywhere. Uh, I'll put it that way. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13. After this manner, therefore, pray ye, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Uh, as, as it is in heaven, give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's a You're able to speak that and people can understand what you're saying. It's not this charismatic, demonic blabbering they do in their services. Uh, the, front, the other point I want to bring up too is that not every born-again saint spoke in tongues, even in the days of the apostles. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 10. Says, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the workings, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So the gifts are divided up. Not every person had the gift of tongues. Further evidence of that, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 to 30. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28 to 30. For, and, sorry, and God has set some, hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret, and I've said this in one of my other videos, it's a rhetorical question. The answer is obviously no. It's that simple. And something I also want to point out as well, I'll just quickly pull up some notes from my other video, is that uh, further showing that not every believer in the, the New Testament church spoke in tongues, even in the days of the apostles, is the fact that um, Lydia and her household, who got saved in Acts chapter 16, verse 13 to 15, the Philippian jailer and his family who got saved in Acts chapter 16, verse 30 to 33, those who got saved in Thessalonica and uh, Bercy, Bury, I think I say it, and Athens in Acts chapter 7, 17, verse 4, Acts chapter 17, verse 12, and Acts chapter 17, verse 34, uh, Crispus and others who got saved in Corinth in Acts chapter 18, verse 8, those who believed in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, verse 17 to 19, and you also got the Jews that believed in Acts chapter 4, verse 4, and Acts chapter 6, verse 7. The Ethiopian eunuch who was saved in Acts chapter 8, verse 35 to 39. And the first people who were saved in Antioch in Acts chapter 11, verse 20 to 21. None of these people spoke in tongues. So, this the whole thing of the private prayer tongues. It's unbiblical. It's unscriptural. Okay, The tongues, it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 to 10. Tongues, the, the gifts, I mean, you can speak in tongues. I actually do know a bit of Russian, a bit of, a tiny bit of French and some Hebrew as well. Scripturally speaking, I can speak in tongues, but the gift of speaking in tongues was, you know, the divine gift of someone who couldn't do it, but was given that ability by God. That was done away with. It, it talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 8 to 10. Why? Because it talks about that which is perfect has come, the word of God. And Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to 19, talks about how once that final revelation was given, you're not supposed to add, add to it. We don't need gifts and miracles and signs and wonders today because we have everything we need in the Word of God. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 16 down to verse 21, talks about the supremacy of the Scriptures even over voices from heaven. So, the Scriptures are a more sure word of prophecy. But this charismatic private prayer tongues, it's just a way to try to twist the Scriptures to cover up for their demonic blabbering and gibberish they do at their services. The charismatic movement is demonic. It is, I, I believe these charismatic churches, these hyper, I mean, not all charismatics, but these hyper charismatic churches, uh, I believe they're filled with devil spirits and these people are devil possessed when they get up there. So anyway, don't be deceived. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the brethren. Goodbye.